Grace and peace to you, my dear brethren and friends. Welcome to another of our Bible studies. I am Sister Karima Paris of the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I do welcome you to our discussion today. Today we want to answer a statement, a question. How do we receive righteousness? Now, what we would be showing you is a reel, a Facebook reel that was done by Andrew Henriquez of Save to Serve. And in his presentation, he was telling us how do we receive righteousness? And so we want to address it. We want to answer Mr. Andrew Henriquez of Safe to Serve by showing him from the scriptures how do we receive righteousness. We want to address imputed and imparted righteousness. We want to look into the scriptures to see if they are two separate events, if it is a justification and sanctification, if justification is imputed righteousness and sanctification is imparted righteousness. We want to also look at the righteousness that is given into us, whether it is the doing of Christ and his death on the cross 2,000 years ago, or if it is the righteousness of God, God himself, that is imputed into the man will also be looking at the fact that justification is a change it is not as if you have never sinned because that would mean that god is a lie for him to look at you as if you have never sinned but he would be looking at your present state seeing that you are righteous you're guileless or you're sin free so these are the things we want to look at from our scriptures. But before we do so, let us bow for a word of prayer. Loving Father which art in heaven, I come before your throne of grace now and I thank you for your mercies towards me. And I ask that you would please forgive me of my sins and come and dwell in my heart that I may have righteousness within and therefore, I'm capable of doing righteousness as you dwell in me. For he that is righteous is righteous even as thou art righteous. Father, help me to execute your work properly for the salvation of men, that they may know the truth, they may accept the truth, for it is only the truth the righteousness in the truth that could save them away from sin and qualify them to inherit the kingdom of God because in the judgment it means righteousness will be in them and righteousness would have been the motivation of their works. I pray dear father also that Pastor Andrew Henriquez would see this video and other videos that were done by the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church addressing this issue. So I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for helping me. In Jesus' holy name I pray these things. Amen. Yes, my dear friends, so we want to begin to look at how do we receive righteousness. And in looking at it, we want to play for you, Pastor Henriquez of Safe to Serve. So let me just get this for you to hear what he is saying as he shows us five steps to receiving righteousness. I also want you to pay close attention to see that each time he speaks about the righteousness of Christ, he shows a cross. This is significant because it shows that he believes in a mechanistic salvation where you are justified at the cross, where it is the righteousness of Christ or the obedience of Christ that is placed on some spiritual account 
in heaven which causes one not to be actually righteous but seen as if he has never sinned so let us look at this clip and i will allow it to repeat so that you would be able to listen well hear well what he is saying as we look at this issue how do we receive the righteousness of Christ? It's simply in five steps. Number one, Christ convicts us of sin. Number two, we surrender our sin. Number three, Christ forgives us of our sins. Number four, he treats us as if we never sinned. And number five, he says, go and sin no more. Within those five steps, we find imputed righteousness. We find imparted righteousness. Step number four, he treats us as if we never sin. Jesus said, Father, take my righteous life and treat them as if they never sinned because I never sinned. That's called imputed righteousness. And then Christ now says, go and sin no more. That's called imparted righteousness because we can choose right without Jesus. How do we receive the righteousness of Christ? It's simply in five steps. Number one, Christ convicts us of sin. Number two, we surrender our sin. Number three, Christ forgives us of our sins. Number four, he treats us as if we never sinned. And number five, he says, go and sin no more. Within those five steps, we find imputed righteousness. We find imparted righteousness. Step number four, he treats us as if we never sin. Jesus said, Father, take my righteous life and treat them as if they never sinned because I never sinned. That's called imputed righteousness. And then Christ now says, go and sin no more. That's called imparted righteousness because we can choose right without Jesus. There you have it, my dear brethren and friends, viewers of this program. We have listened to Pastor Henriquez, who gives us five steps to receive the righteousness of Christ. And he outlines them as Christ convicts us of sin. We surrender our sins. Christ forgives us of our sins. He treats us as if we have never sinned. And he says, go and sin no more. He said these within these five steps, you would find imputed and imparted righteousness we want to address this imputed and imparted righteousness he says he repeats point four and he says he treats us as if we never sinned and he also said that jesus says to the father take my righteous life and you will notice it points to the cross and treat them as if they have never sinned because I have never sinned. So we understand from that it is Christ's obedience that is given into the per given to the person. Normally, Seventh Day Adventist believes that there is a, a, a spiritual account in heaven where the righteousness of Christ, which they claim is His obedience, is placed on an account for you. He said. Christ says to the Father to treat us as if we have never sinned because he have never sinned and that is called imputed righteousness. And then Christ says go and sin no more. That is called imparted righteousness. So we want to address these things and to address them because they are not accurate they are not true what is being taught by pastor um andrew Hen henriquez and we want to look into the bible to be able to answer these things what we want you to see is that as we look into the scriptures imputed and imparted righteousness takes place the same time it is the same event imputed righteousness is the method by which god gives the man righteousness imputation is the method of which god gives it is god's mental estimation that gives the righteousness into the man when god imputes the righteousness into the man God imparts the righteousness into the man 
so that the man actually become possessor of righteousness. We'll learn what the righteousness is that God imputes and imparts into the man at justification because it is at justification God imputes righteousness and thus imparts righteousness. We will also see in the scriptures where this righteousness goes we will consider as well from the scriptures that this imputation which is the impartation of righteousness is actually the forgiveness of sins which actually changes the person so god does not have to look at the person as if he has never sinned because god knows that the person have a record of sinning in the book of iniquity but what god sees in the man as he non imputes sin and imputes righteousness is that he sees the man as being righteous based on the fact that he god himself have justified the ungodly so we want to look into the scripture and the main focus scripture that we will be talking about is romans chapter 4 but we will get some more scriptures to help us to understand what we are dealing with when we are answering some of the claims now when we consider romans chapter 4 i want you to understand that romans chapter 4 shows us how a person is actually justified it teaches us about justification and from verse 1 to 5 actually shows us that no man could be justified by works but justification is a work of God it is something that God does by his grace so let us consider Romans chapter 4 1 to 5 this is what Abraham our father has found out when he considers what justification is is all about and who justify it it is the not the man by his righteous works cause himself to be righteous but god is the one who caused the person to be righteous so romans chapter 4 and we read from verse 1 to 5 first because we want to establish the fact that when a person is justified it is not by his good works that he do but it is actually by God he is justified. So we are told in the scriptures. What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh had found. So we are going to find out what Abraham found out concerning justification. How a man is made righteous. How a man receives righteousness. We are told. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had wear of the glory, but not before God. So we understand that it is not by the works that a person does. He is justified. He can do works and look righteous in the sight of man, but not in the sight of God. We are told here in verse 3. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So here we are told that Abraham fulfilled one of the conditions as is seen here on the prevenient grace. Now repentance and believing goes together. So when we are told that Abraham believed God it is because he repented and believed so he fulfilled the condition to receive righteousness so there's a condition that we must fulfill in order for us to receive righteousness we must repent of our sins and believe the gospel or forsake the 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 responsibility the guilt responsibility or the reasons for sinning or the idols for sinning so that we could receive righteousness then we are told here as we see and it was counted for him unto him for righteousness verse 4 we are told now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt 
but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So we see here that it is when you believe, the ungodly man believe the revelation of God to his mind, that God is the one who justified the ungodly. But we notice that there are some terms, some words used in the passage, which means to impute. We are told it was counted to him for righteousness, which is the faith that he believed or the promises he believed or the word of God that was spoken to him that he believed that was counted. That is one of the word. Then we are told in verse 4, the reward not reckoned. So we see counted, reckoned. And when you consider verse again we see the word counted now when you look at verse 6 you see the word impute so counted reckoned and impute all means the same thing it is the greek word being logizomai and it speaks about a mental estimation it speaks about counting mentally in your mind it does not tell us it is a declaration but it's a mental um estimation or esteeming god's mental esteeming right that is what it is so we see for sure that a person is not justified by his works it is god who justifies the person when he fulfills the condition of believing the faith the truths the promises of god now what we want to do is to look now at Abraham's experience, what we are told about Abraham, and we want to see what we are told about Abraham when he was justified, what God did, what God did to him when he was justified. We are going to read from verse 11. And when we read verse 11, we will go to 12 as well to understand what happened to him, what God did. It is what God does, what God do in justification. We are told here that when God counted unto him the faith that he believed for righteousness, you see it here in verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted or imputed unto him for righteousness. So we know God imputed the faith that Abraham believed so that he could get righteousness. So that is imputation. We see the word impute, we know imputation. Now the Bible doesn't have the word impart, but when you consider what is being said, in this very same passage, you understand that when God imputes, he actually imparts. How do you know that imputation and impart talks about the same event, shows what God does in his estimation that makes, in his estimation that gives? We will see that Abraham actually had the righteousness of God. He actually believed. Um, he actually received righteousness. So since God imputes or counts or reckons the righteousness unto him or into him by the faith that he believes, what happened when God imputed or count or reckoned the righteousness to him? He actually had it. He received it. It therefore means that when God imputes he actually imparts let us look at it in verse 11 we are told here in verse 11 and he received the sign of circumcision you see that word he received it he literally got it if you received your paycheck it means you 
have your picture you got your picture it is actually yours in your possession it belongs to you you have it so we are told he received the sign of circumcision so circumcision the physical circumcising of the foreskin of the flesh there's a sign or a token of it we are told and what is that a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed into them also so here we are told from the scriptures that when God counted or imputed unto Abraham righteousness that Abraham actually had received the righteousness so in other words righteousness was imparted to him when God imputed to him so it is one event it is not you being righteousness being imputed into you when Jesus say Lord or Father I have not sinned and therefore see them as if they are sin they have not sinned sorry and that is imputation no that is not imputation imputation is not based on Christ's obedience we see the condition that the person has to fulfill in order for God to impute righteousness to the person. So we see again them that believe though they be not circumcised. So the condition for you being um, justified receiving the righteousness in you is you believe in the faith that God may impute the righteousness which is his mental esteeming of you now because you rejected you repent you rejected the idol values you believe the gospel God gives you he imputes righteousness his mental esteeming that gives you that gives you that righteousness that is imputation so it is at justification the chain center of the plan of salvation god imputes righteousness and imparts righteousness to you so much so we are told that abraham walked after the righteousness that he received and we who believe who are not circumcised is supposed to walk after the step of the faith of our father abraham when we receive the righteousness so you could walk after righteousness if you have righteousness in you which means that righteousness is imparted to you when god imputes it let us read it verse 12 and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So he had the faith that have the righteousness in it. Now, having seen that, we want you to understand what is this righteousness that is imputed into the man that is imparted to the man at justification what is this righteousness now we want to consider about three scriptures to help us to understand what is this righteousness is it the obedience of Christ that is given to us when God imputes righteousness to us what is it is it the 33 years of obedience or is it the divine nature 
that is given to us? Is it the divine character that is given to us? Let us understand what is given to us. What is this righteousness? What is this righteousness? Is it Christ dying on the cross? What is this righteousness that is given to us? When we consider Paul's statement in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, we will couple that with Romans chapter 3 to show you that there's a righteousness that comes through the faith of Christ, which is the righteousness of God. And Jeremiah will tell us that it is actually God himself that you receive the divine nature. You become a partaker of the divine nature who is righteousness. And Christ is made unto us righteousness. So let us see Philippians chapter 3 and we will consider verse 9. Which tells us here, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but which is through the faith of christ the righteousness which is of god by faith you see that so there's a righteousness of god that is by the faith or through the faith of jesus christ that Paul wants to be found in. He doesn't want in the judgment to have his own righteousness. But what he wants is the righteousness of God in him, which comes through the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, when we consider Romans chapter 3, we will see that there is a difference between the righteousness of the law or the works of the law. And there is a... Um, the righteousness of God. So let us look at Romans chapter 3 and we want to consider from verse 20 to 22 because we are seeking to determine what is this righteousness that is imputed and imparted to you at justification. This is what we are told. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. You see, so we cannot be justified by the deeds of the law or doing the works of the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law has its purpose. It makes us conscious of what sin is. It points out to our mind what sin is. Then we are told in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God. You see that? But now the righteousness of God without the law or apart from the law or separated from the law is manifested. So there's the righteousness of God that is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets so there's a righteousness that is revealed through the writings of moses the law and through the prophets verse 22 tells us even the righteousness of god you see so it has to do with god god is righteousness so even the righteousness of god which is by faith or through or out of the faith of Jesus. So what did Paul say? He wants to be found having the righteousness of God, which is true, the faith of Jesus. So he wants to have God in him. So we'll show you for sure that it is God that is being spoken of here. So the righteousness that you receive is God himself in you. Not on some account in heaven, not in some spiritual account in heaven, and will prove that the righteousness of God that is imputed is all and imparted into you is actually uh, in your mind. Let us see, or in your heart. So let us read it again for all, sorry, not verse 23, but verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is 
by faith of Jesus Christ. And the Greek word here for unto is into, all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So verse 22 also shows us that imputation is impartation. Even though the word impute is not there, we know a man gets righteousness, how he gets righteousness, it is by God's imputation, his mental esteeming, his mental esteeming of the man that causes him to get righteousness in him because when God mentally esteems you as having righteousness, you do have righteousness as Abraham received the righteousness of God. He had the righteousness of God and we are told it goes into the man. It becomes the possession of the man. It becomes a part of the man's experience, not on some account in heaven. Look at it again. We are told him, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ into all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference so the man wears the righteousness of god as a garment which means he go and sin no more he is obedient to the law of god he's obedient to the will of god he submits to the will of god he is sin free as a result of righteousness being in him i will come to see that but we are establishing the fact that the righteousness of God that the man receives or the righteousness that the man receives at justification when God imputes or mentally esteems righteousness to the man. He doesn't declare the man righteous or having righteousness. He mentally esteems. It is not audible. But he mentally esteems the righteousness to the be the man on. And the man, it goes into the man showing it is imparted to him when God esteems it as his. And we are seeing what is this righteousness. Let us go to Jeremiah. One of the prophets who clearly tells us what this righteousness is. It is not the 33 years of obedience of Christ that goes some on some mystical spiritual account in heaven let us see what it is in um jeremiah chapter 23 5 and 6 this is what we are told behold the days come said yahweh that i will raise unto david a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth in his days judah shall be saved and israel shall dwell safely so he is supposed to be the savior this person that is being spoken of here who is going to come he is the savior from sin he shall save his people from sin not in sin okay so it wouldn't be an as if he has never sinned but he would be made righteous by the one who is coming and so we are told in his day, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called Yahweh, our righteousness. So it is Yahweh himself who is our righteousness. It is Yahweh who is righteousness. Because as Daniel shows, that confusion belongs to us. But righteousness belongs to you, O Yahweh, when he prayed to him. So Yahweh, our righteousness, is not Yahweh have righteousness to give, but is that he himself is righteousness. This is talking about God himself who came. He is our righteousness. Okay? So the righteousness of that God imputes and imparts to, to the one who repents and believes, is himself yes let us look at psalm let us consider psalm 40 and verse 8 psalm 40 and verse 8 is going to tell us clearly 
that it is not in heaven the righteousness goes but it is going in your heart so righteousness into all and upon all who believe righteousness is imputed to you and you have it you receive it where does it go psalm 40 and verse 10 40 and verse 10 if i said eight i'm sorry but psalm 40 and verse 10 tells us i have not hid thy righteousness within my heart i have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation i have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation so here we see david who experienced the imputation of righteousness and the non-imputation of sin is telling us the righteousness of god is in his heart in his mind and he is not going to conceal it he's going to tell people about the righteousness of god he's going to tell people about god and his loving kindness showing that righteousness that is imputed to you is imparted to you in your mind into all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference that is what the bible tells us let us go back to romans chapter 4 at this point and what we want to establish for you by god's grace is the fact that in romans chapter 4 we see justification is the same as you being forgiven why because of the method that is described that god used in forgiving a man of his sins god non imputes sin and he imputes righteousness he imputes righteousness to the man and that is the man being forgiven when we look at it from romans chapter 4 we want to consider as well psalm chapter 32 that causes us to see that the man actually is changed from having guile in his experience from having sin in his mind to having being made righteous he is now righteous and he is now upright in heart he is upright in heart let us let us look at these things because justification which is the imputation of righteousness the impartation of righteousness is the same forgiveness which is the non-imputing of sin and the imputing of righteousness if god non imputes sin he does not see you as if you never sinned but when he imputes sin he makes you righteous sorry when he imputes righteousness when he imputes righteousness he actually makes you righteous he makes you upright in heart so your present experience is one where he sees you as not having sin in you not as if you have never sinned but that you have no sin in you let us look at it so when we turn to romans chapter 4 again and we're going to consider verse 6 to 8 we would see how justification the imputation of righteousness the impartation of righteousness is the same forgiveness of sins that god does this is what we are told even as david also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputes righteousness without works so what does god do he imputes righteousness without works without you doing any works because he's not repaying you it's not some account where he is repaying you for something that 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 you have done it is by grace through faith right verse 7 tells us so we see god imputes righteousness verse 7 says blessed are they whose iniquity are forgiven and whose sins are covered or lifted so god lifts the sin from you he removes the sin from you when he imputes righteousness it's because he already non impute or lift the sin from you then we are told in verse 8 blessed is the man to whom the lord will not 
impute sin. So when he doesn't impute sin, it is because the sin is lifted, it is removed from you, and he puts righteousness in you. So when you repent and believe the gospel, God lifts the sin. He non imputes the sin. He doesn't see the sin as yours anymore or the idol values. So he have past sins, those that are past, but he have also the idols that cause him to sin, the past present sinning experience that God now removes the idol values from the mind or the carnal mind. And when he removes the carnal mind, he is now able to impute righteousness into the mind. So in forgiving you, in justifying you, God non imputes sin or he lifts the sin and he imputes righteousness and so he could see you as righteous. Let us see it from Psalm 32. Psalm 32 gives us an understanding of this blessedness of the man, which is justification, and what God does when he non imputes sin and he imputes righteousness. So let us look at it from Psalm 32, which tells us this. So we would read 1, 2, and we read 6. We would read we would read one, two, five, and we would read verse eleven to show how the man is changed. Okay? So this is what we are told in verse one. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That happens when God forgives you when god lifts your sin he describes it as god non-imputing sin he says blessed is the man unto whom the lord or yahweh imputed not iniquity so god imputed not iniquity and what happens and in whose spirit there is no guile. So when God non imputes iniquity, when the man's sin is lifted or covered, the man now has the experience of being without guile. So the man is made guileless or sin free or iniquity free. What else we are told in verse 5? Verse 5 tells us. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto Yahweh, and he forgavest, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Take note. So how does David show God forgive the iniquity of his sin? By non imputing it cause him to be guileless in his experience or lifting the sin from him that is how he explains justification that is how he explains to us the imputation of righteousness which brings about a change in the experience so when the man is changing his experience he is not as if he has never sinned before but he is now made righteous let us see that in verse 11 verse 11 says be glad in yahweh and rejoice ye righteous you see so when god non imputes sin and imputes righteousness he makes you righteous so that he you can rejoice in yahweh ye righteous and shout for joy all that are upright in heart. You're upright in heart because Yahweh who is upright, Yahweh our righteousness is in you. Making you upright. So there's a substitution. The substitution from iniquity or the carnal mind or sin in the mind or the experience or guile in the experience. To where you are now upright in heart, you are made righteous because righteousness is imputed unto you. And that causes a change in the experience. So, so justification, which is the non-imputation of sin, which is the imputation of righteousness or forgiveness, 
causes a change in your experience, making you guileless, making you righteous, making you upright in heart. So when God sees you, he sees you as righteous because righteousness is in you. Now we want to see this again, how that a change actually takes place. Because the Bible describes man as being dead in trespasses and sins. And when we are talking about imputation of righteousness, there's an example given us concerning Abraham. So we are going back to Romans chapter 4 to help us to see that when God calls something that was not as though it was, it's because or it is, it is because it actually happens. So my dear friends, having seen that forgiveness and justification is the same and uh, there's a change that is brought about when the person is justified or forgiven or when righteousness is imputed to him and imparted to him at the same time, we want to show you again from Romans chapter 4 that it is actually a change that takes place so when we consider now verse 17 18 19 20 and 21 we will see an illustration of god imputing righteousness and god also causing something that was not as though it was so a person is dead in trespasses and sins and god esteems the man as no longer having the sin values in him because he repents of it it actually when god imputes the righteousness when he non-imputes sin he actually causes a change because what is substituted the carnal mind for the spiritual mind idol values for righteousness let us see an illustration of this that really shows that the man is actually made righteous and it is not as if you have never sinned but that there is actually an, a record of you sinning but god now makes you righteous or sin free or guile free or without iniquity but it is illustrated in what happened to abraham let us look at it we are told as it is written i have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed even god who quickened the dead and call it those things which be not as do the were. so we will see what that is because abraham didn't have any seed but god made him and his wife to be able to have seed we are told in verse 18 who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be so you see he believed that which was spoken to him and it was imputed to him for righteousness and he kept that hope alive in him then we are told in verse 19 and being not weak in faith, so he wasn't weak in the faith or the spoken word or the revealed truths of God. And being not weak in faith, the faith, he considered not his own body now dead, you see. So in his present state, his body was now dead when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of sarah's room so what was his experience he was dead sarah's room was dry up she wasn't producing any eggs anymore she couldn't uh make children so that was their situation but god called that which was not into being when he imputed he mentally esteemed and it was so look at it Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that 
what he had promised he is able to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness you see so the truth the spoken word was imputed to him for righteousness he believed that god is able to perform that which he said he would do so when it comes to forgiveness of sins that which god said he would do which is to non impute sin which is to cover or lift your sin and give you righteousness in you make you guileless in your experience make you iniquity free god is able to do it so he's not going to pretend as if you never sin he's not going to give you in some record in heaven all the obedience of christ and you are still sinful he's not going to leave you to do works on your own to attain to heaven no you have to have righteousness in you and that righteousness in you cause you to be righteous and cause you to do righteous things let us see this that when you receive righteousness through the faith in you we are told into and upon all them that believe you will notice that the person don't make void the law through faith but he establishes the law therefore he goes and sin no more so a person could only go and sin no more if righteousness is imputed into his mind this is what we are told if we could just read verse 22 again just to show you the impartation and imputation of righteous of righteousness and then we consider verse 30 and 31 28 30 and 31 to show when god puts righteousness in you you go and sin no more you keep the commandments this is what we are told even the righteousness of god which is by faith or through the faith or out of the faith of of jesus christ is which means into all that is impartation and imputation at the same time it is the same event into all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference and then we are told in verse 28 therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law so when you are justified by faith you receive righteousness in you and what happens verse 30 tells us seeing it is one god which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith do we make void the law through faith god forbid so we don't continue in sin receiving righteousness in you cause you to establish the law we establish the law through faith that gives righteousness in the heart that is what god shows because of the radical change that takes place so he is going to see you as righteous and see you doing righteous things it is not christ's 33 years of obedience that is placed on some spiritual account in heaven the righteousness of god god himself comes to dwell in you and as god who is righteousness comes to dwell in you he makes you righteous and cause you to do righteous things now i want to show you something that is important i have two books on the screen here that i want you to pay attention to i want you to get a copy of them they're very important one is studies on or in justification righteousness and salvation by naira medina and studies on Adventism's evangelical gospel. You see what um, Andrew Hendricks has taught us there? That is evangelical gospel. That is not the gospel of Seventh-day Adventism. That is not the gospel of the apostles. That is not the gospel of Christ that he teaches. So he needs to get the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ teaches a complete change through justification, through the work of God, God changes you. Now, Sister White tells us about a spurious holiness that will be in the church. And she tells us that ministers will call Satan the great leader of apostasy, Christ our righteousness. That is so because they present a Christ who cannot change you. They present a Christ that saves you in sin. 
they present a Christ that cannot really make you holy. But it's somehow you appear to be holy without righteousness in you. This is what she says as I get this quotation for you. My soul is made very sad to see how quickly some who have had light and truth will accept the deceptions of Satan and be charmed with a spurious holiness. It is not real holiness. It is fake. It is a pretension. It is not genuine. When men turn away from the landmarks the Lord has established that we may understand our position as marked out in the prophecies, they are going they know not whither. So you see, when a person accepts the deception of Satan concerning justification by faith as not making it a change that is done, but a declaration that deception of Satan caused one to be charmed with a spirit's holiness and caused them to not to see where they are going. They, you cannot see where you are going as Seventh-day Adventists with a false spurious holiness without God in you. She says here, as if men and women who have the knowledge of the truth are so separated from their great leader that they will take the great leader of apostasy and name him Christ our righteousness. It is because they have not sunk deep into the minds of truth, they are not able to distinguish the precious or from the base material. You see what is happening here. When Andrew Henriquez teach you about a Christ or a righteousness that has to do with his works done 2,000 years ago and present that as the righteousness of God that you receive, that you cannot receive in you, that is as a result of of accepting the deception of Satan that is a result of being charmed by a spurious holiness, the deception of Satan, and what happens? They take the great leader of apostasy and call him Christ our righteousness, a Christ that cannot save or a Christ that saves in sin. And it is because they have not sunk deep into the minds of truth they are not able to distinguish the precious ore from the base material. So what Andrew Henriquez need to do is to go and study his scripture over. Study over Romans chapter 4 to see that imputed righteousness is imparted righteousness. It is forgiveness of sin. It is justification. It is not sanctification and justification. It is one event that God gives. If you don't accept that truth that shows imputation is forgiveness, is impartation of righteousness at the same time. It is done at justification. It is done when you are forgiven. What do you have? You have a spurious God, a spurious holiness. A spurious holiness and nobody could pass in the investigation in the investigative judgment with a spurious holiness nobody could pass in the investigative judgment having Satan the great leader of apostasy and taking him to be Christ our righteousness naming him to be Christ our righteousness by having the deception of Satan that salvation is in sin and that God sees you as if you have never sinned. That is a lie on the character of God. That is a lie on the divine nature. And nobody could be saved in lie, in Satan's deception. Nobody could be saved in that experience. And so we call upon Andrew Henriquez to repent of this. And pray and ask God to help him to understand justification of life. To understand imputation and impartation from the scriptures. Not from theologians. Not from the seminaries. But from the Holy Spirit teaching him. The deep things of God. And so this is where we come to 
and end of our study. Please go over these things. Please ask God to help you to understand. and He will help you to see. So that you could have righteousness in you. and Be righteous even as he is righteous. Keeping all his commandments in the experience of sin freeness or no guile. You being upright in heart. You being righteous. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Father, for showing us these things, these important salient truth that shows justification is a change and the method you use to justify or forgive us, making us guileless or sin-free, making us upright, making us righteous, changing us from being ungodly to godly. It is your work by your mental estimation or esteeming that actually makes the person righteous and give the person righteousness in their heart so that they could go and sin no more. Father, I pray for our Seventh-day Adventist brethren who have been drunken with the deception of Satan that presents a justification as a plan of salvation that doesn't actually change the man but causes the man to have sin in him and think that you will see them as righteous and think that somehow you will give them on some account all the righteous deeds that Christ has done, leaving them free. Please have mercy upon them and help them to study the scriptures, to see these important things, to accept these important things, to live the truth and to help us to spread the third angel's message, which is righteousness by faith. So help us, we pray, to get the beachheads, to get an audience in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Help us to have all-time sinfulness that we may receive of your latter rain. And that we may finish this work in our generation and bring back Christ to this earth. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.